He referred to himself in emails on a BDSM website as master. And that's what we knew him as, the slave master. Anybody who really is a master, it's very, very rare for them to refer to themselves as a master. In our world, that's a huge red flag. Because you knew somebody was getting hurt, but the question was, what was consensual, and when did it cross the line? It's one of those aw moments where everybody's jaw kind of drops, and you know, the hair stands up on the back of your neck. There was no crime scene. There was no body. There was just no hard evidence to indicate that anything had happened to them. He knew what the rules of the game were, and he was able to turn those rules to his own benefit. FBI Criminal Pursuit. It's the winter of 1985 in Overland Park, Kansas, a quiet bedroom community nestled just south of Kansas City. Little do residents know, their peaceful enclave is about to become ground zero in a series of investigations that will span years unearthing some of the most diabolical and sordid crimes area law enforcement has ever seen. On January 11th, a frantic young woman contacts the Overland Park Police Department. She's concerned about her sister-in-law, Lisa Stacy, who she hasn't heard from in days. Lisa Stacy was a troubled young woman, uh, 19, and she was involved with a, a man named Carl. She got pregnant, um, they got married, and they had this um, baby, uh, Tiffany Lynn Stacy, but um, the marriage quickly, quickly fell apart within a few months. The couple splits, and Carl moves to the Chicago area, where he re-enlists in the Navy. With no job and no place to go, Lisa and four-month-old Tiffany soon find themselves living in a group home for women. But just a few days before her disappearance, Lisa's luck takes a turn when she's accepted into a coveted Kansas City outreach program. The Kansas Outreach Program was a program that a businessman named John Osborne had started to help um, young women with uh, young babies get a restart in life. It's an opportunity that's too good to refuse. And on January 9th, Osborne picks Lisa and Tiffany up at her in-law's house. He had put them up at a, at a hotel in Overland Park, Kansas, near his, his office. But later that same night, Lisa makes a panicked phone call to her mother-in-law. She's hysterical. She is crying and saying, they're saying you're going to take my baby away from me. You're saying I'm a bad mother. And the mother-in-law said, we're, you know, we're not trying to take your baby away. And Lisa said, they've made me sign four blank sheets of paper. And the mother-in-law says, don't do anything, don't sign anything. I'm not involved in this in any way. And then Lisa says, they're coming now. And she hangs up. And that's the last time anybody hears from Lisa. The following morning, her in-laws call the motel in search of Lisa and the baby. But they're stunned to learn that Lisa is gone, checked out. Her bill paid with a credit card from a local business. They discover that um, it was not John Osborne that had rented the room, but a John Robinson. And they got an address for the business that he runs, um, Equitu. Confused and worried, Lisa's brother-in-law checks out the firm. A young man in his 20s, tall, um, is is there and basically rudely pushes him out the door then the mystery intensifies with yet another strange phone call stacy's family receives a call from a priest father martin at a um a local a mission in downtown kansas city 
This father, Martin, says that he's um, seen Lisa and Tiffany, that they're fine, um, but that they've taken off um, and left town with a, with a guy named Bill. So the family, to verify this story, calls the mission, and they're told that there is no Father Martin at the mission. And at that point, the family um, is even more concerned, and they go to the police. Unfortunately, investigators have little to go on, except for one thing. The case feels eerily familiar. Four months earlier, another 19-year-old named Paula Godfrey was living in the Overland Park area when she, too, mysteriously disappeared. She answered an advertisement for a secretary position, and it involved some travel, some training, and things like that. Her parents never heard from her again. They did get a letter saying that she needed some time on her own away from her family and um, you know she was off finding herself they didn't believe it was really from her paula's mother convinced her husband to go and report it to the police but paula is of legal age and with no evidence of a crime there's little police can do it's not against the law to be a missing person and the letters are saying, yeah, I'm fine, leave me alone. Yet now, a young mother and her baby have also gone missing. And that has authorities growing increasingly concerned. I had a couple of small kids, and I understood what it would be like to, to lose a, a small child. And I think you know, that made it even more personal to me. The search for Lisa and her baby goes by the book. Police start with the immediate family and work their way outward. They question Lisa's estranged husband, Carl, with whom she had a turbulent relationship. He had a solid al alibi with him. He was back in Chicago. And, I mean, he wasn't even in the picture at the time. Investigators also interviewed John Robinson the man in charge of the outreach program Lisa hoped would be her salvation. And he told me, yeah, she was referred to me with a young baby. Uh, you know, I, I'd said I would put her up in my Kansas City outreach program. Lisa came to his office with a, a, a young man by the name of Bill, who she said was her new boyfriend, and that, you know, they were going to go off together and they were going to start a new life, and she really thanked Robinson for all of his help and for being uh, there to support her. But she really thought it was coming together and she was just going to go start a new life. Bill, investigators have heard the name before. The mysterious Father Martin had also spoken of a bill, claiming that he and Lisa had run off together. Now police wonder what they have, a case of impetuous young love or perhaps something more lethal. It was just part of the confusion that was this case as to how does, how does this all tie together? According to reports, she'd recently joined a Kansas City outreach program for young mothers, but hit a roadblock when she met a new boyfriend, a man police know only as Bill. And from there, the trail goes cold. There was no evidence of a crime. There was uh, no crime scene. There was no body. There was, uh, I mean, there was just no hard evidence to prove that anything had happened to them. Then, suddenly, a new twist in the case. These letters began to surface. Uh, Lisa's mother-in-law got one. The battered women's shelter got one. And in this letter, Lisa had told the mother-in-law, I've been down and out, you know, things haven't been going good, but I've got an opportunity here to start a new life, and I'm going to do that. So 
uh, you know, thank you for all that you've done, but I'm going to go off and, and start a new life, and, and I'm just fine. There's no mention of Bill, but the rest of the letter seems sincere, except for one thing. This letter was typed. Lisa didn't know how to type. And it, it just didn't sound like Lisa at all. But with little else to go on, the case of Lisa and Tiffany Stacy slowly goes cold. Two years later, in June 1987, another Kansas City resident reaches out to Overland Park Police. He's searching for his stepsister, 27-year-old Catherine Clampett, a recent transplant to the area who he hasn't heard from in weeks. She was going to move up here to, to try to improve her life. She answers an ad in the newspaper for an executive secretary um, working for a busy CEO. And um, she goes to work for a man named John Dawson. But not long after starting the new job, Catherine goes AWOL, or so it seems. A short time later, her mother, back in Wichita Falls, Texas, gets a letter, a typewritten letter that's signed by her daughter, but um, it doesn't sound that much like her daughter, and she grows concerned. Catherine's stepbrother calls her office and asks to speak to her boss, John Dawson. But he's told that no such employee exists. Her stepbrother went through her belongings. Um, he found a receipt um, for the hotel where she had stayed, and it was signed by a John Robinson, not John Dawson. In fact, it's the very same John Robinson who recruited Lisa Stacy into the Women's Outreach Program two years earlier. A quick check reveals that Robinson is the owner of the company where Catherine works, a consulting firm called Equa2. So Catherine Clampett's stepbrother pays a visit to the, to the Equa2 offices only to find out that they're closed and that John Robinson is actually starting to serve a prison sentence. As it turns out, Robinson had been arrested just weeks earlier on charges of fraud and theft. That he was just a small-time uh, con man. There was no indication that he had been involved in anything really much more than that. Investigators waste no time questioning anyone who may have information on Catherine, but leads are few and far between. When the detectives started talking to potential witnesses, you know, there was always, yeah, I saw her a couple of weeks ago, or, you know, I know that she didn't go to work for Robinson after all. Witnesses' memories are spotty and contradictory, but there's an even bigger problem. The connection wasn't made immediately between Paul Godfrey, Lisa Stacy, and Catherine Clampett. The cases were being uh, distributed to, to different detectives. Now you can type in the names and a query can be popped up and searched in 15 seconds. Back then, everything was done by hand. And police have little reason to cross-reference old files when there's no concrete evidence that a crime has been committed in the first place. There were three disappearances connected to Robinson, but all three involved troubled women who were going off elsewhere, who had sent letters home and wanted to be left alone. The police were just treating these as typical missing persons reports where these women probably just did not want to be found. More than 10 years pass, and one by one, the cases go cold. Then, in March of 2000, a Michigan woman named Carolyn Troughton grows concerned about the welfare of her 27-year-old daughter, Suzette. Suzette Troughton had told her family that she was moving to Kansas. 
because she was going to go to work for a wealthy businessman that did a lot of international traveling. And she was going to take care of this businessman's ailing father while they traveled. But within just a month of her arrival, Suzette appears to have vanished without a trace. Taking matters into her own hands, Carolyn Troughton calls her daughter's employer, demanding to know Suzette's whereabouts. He tells her that Suzette has decided to take off with a man named Jim Turner, and they were going to be sailing around the world, and she was not going to be working for him after all. Suzette Troughton was a mama's girl was always in contact with her mom, either through email or on the telephone. Carolyn knew that her daughter would call her and let her fill her in on what was going on. She knew something terrible had happened to her. Police are worried too. They've heard this story before, several times. And when Carolyn Troughton reveals the employer's name, it is one they know all too well, John Robinson. Ironically, the, the sergeant and the watch commander that reviewed the, the missing persons report that night both had dealings or were aware of John Robinson from the 1980s. This time, local police are determined not to let him slip through their fingers. And it isn't long before agents from the FBI's Kansas City field office join the investigation. We spent uh, a lot of our time scratching our heads and and just trying to figure out what it is that that he was up to at the time he supposedly was running a business that was basically a magazine for mobile home trailer parks robinson's also married with four children and has worked hard to gain respect within the local community But police files tell a different story. We knew he was a con man. We knew he was a thief. John had a number of convictions over the years, mainly for small time uh, con artist types of activities, embezzlements, those sort of things. He never worked a legitimate job that he did not cheat the company out of some kind of money. Still, investigators find themselves facing a number of troubling questions. First and foremost, what would a two-bit con man be doing mixed up in the cases of four missing women? And how do you go about mounting an investigation with no evidence of an actual crime being committed? That we really needed to find all these individuals, make sure, number one, they were alive, uh, and uh, uh, find out what kind of contact he was having with them. Uh, what was he trying to do? Authorities are particularly concerned about Tiffany Stacy, who disappeared at just four months old. We were all getting together on this, trying to get a handle on it, and we didn't know what was going to be at the end of this road. We had no idea. Soon, investigators get a new lead when letters and emails begin arriving at the home of Carolyn Troughton, all signed by her missing daughter, Suzette. Then they started receiving letters from uh, California. And then there were a letter from Veracruz, Mexico, that uh, kind of threw us for a loop. The mother never believed them. She said, you know, I read these letters, and I can tell by the way they're written, by the fact that there's no spelling errors, by the wording that she uses, the phrases that she used. She said, I can tell that my daughter is not writing these letters. But the perplexing thing to her and all of us was, she said, the signature is my daughter's. The pattern is a familiar one, but police hold off on confronting Robinson. They don't want to tip their hand just yet. Instead, they begin interviewing Suzette's family and friends looking for anything that might bolster their case. What they discover next turns the entire investigation on its head. Well, Suzette Trout was kind of a free spirit. She was in the BDSM lifestyle. Uh, she was always on the internet. 
with people in that lifestyle, and uh, she was ready to be on her own. BDSM stands for bondage and discipline, dominance and submission, sadism and masochism. A great deal of what this comes down to is somebody is enjoying the fantasy of having power and somebody is enjoying the fantasy of being powerless. Though legal, BDSM is a practice often conducted in secret. None of us really knew anything about it. So while we're trying to work the case, we're trying to learn about this lifestyle. Pain is part of this lifestyle. Uh, so slapping or, or spanking someone, that's natural. According to her friends, Suzette was a sexual submissive or slave who often surfed the internet looking for a master. A master is usually a person who owns a slave. The slave has acknowledged that person as their master. Uh, and they are held with a certain level of respect in the community. Investigators learned that Suzette had recently found a new master, but this time, she was in way over her head. Anybody who really is a master, it's very, very rare for them to refer to themselves as a master. According to Suzette's friends, she was a member of the bondage and discipline, dominance and submission, sadism and masochism community, or BDSM. More people have joined the community since the 90s, since the stigma has started to fall away. Police also learned that prior to her disappearance, Suzette corresponded with a BDSM master online and relocated to Kansas City to work as a nurse's aide for his elderly father. She would come to this area at the behest of this guy named John Robinson. But while Robinson has a checkered background, to say the least, on the surface, there's nothing to suggest the suburban father of four would have been involved in something like BDSM, let alone anything dangerous. For a missing person, name of the social worker. I never ever had the feeling that uh, this John Robinson was a killer. Our impression of John Robinson was that he was a small time con artist who had been involved in a number of, of con schemes over the years, uh, but nothing really more than that. Still, with connections to a string of mysterious disappearances, there's no denying Robinson is more than he appears to be. Mr. Robinson had his hand in a lot of different uh, areas. Uh, he was uh, in, in various businesses. Uh, he made contact with uh, hospitals about unwed mothers. He'd also made contact with charities uh, about un unwed mothers, uh, helping them out. So it was very bizarre. He was after these women for some strange sexual reason. I'm not sure what it was. We knew that um, he was involved with at least three women that had been reported as missing to us in the 1980s. So we had a pretty good history on him. We had a pretty good feeling that the guy was up to no good. Paula Godfrey, Lisa and Tiffany Stacy, Catherine Clampett, and now Suzette Troughton. The question is, could any of these missing women still be alive? Could they be serving as sex slaves or something police haven't even considered? This was the type of case that, you know, you went home at night and that's all you thought about is, what am I missing? What could I have done? What should I be doing? You're thinking of that as you drive to work, or as you're going through the file, you're going, there's got to be something here I'm missing. Determined to prove once and for all that this small-time crook is up to something more sinister, local police and FBI begin to dig deeper. We called in all the retired detectives that had, you know, worked his cases, the FBI agents, the Missouri probation officer, we were looking into his criminal background, uh, trying to find any clues that we could use against him. I believe the, the baby was probably still alive someplace. Tiffany Stacy, missing since 1985, 
would be 15 years old by now. We actually thought that he may have been involved in some sort of a baby selling uh, ring. And there was also uh, activity of uh, uh, prostitution involved in this background as well. well. We had a couple of informants. One was a guy uh, who was uh, in the topless bars. He was bird dogging uh, women for John Robinson. I had another informant who actually uh, posed for some pictures and did some stuff. Uh, with John. John tried to recruit her, telling her that she could make two to three thousand dollars in a weekend if she would fly around the country doing these these uh, bid these jobs for him. We thought perhaps um, that he might have been taking the women and selling them into prostitution, maybe across state lines, maybe even international lines. It was hard to figure out exactly what he was doing. Uh, you know, it seemed like he was a con man on one hand, but on the other hand, he seemed to be involved in these other things which were darker. With a mounting list of circumstantial evidence, but still no proof of an actual crime, investigators set up surveillance so they can track every move their suspect makes. We didn't want to tip our hand at any time to let Robinson know. We contacted him, the gig was up, and he would start, you know, denying everything and possibly sending us on goose chases. Within a matter of weeks, investigators learned that Robinson is, in fact, living a dual life. Well, at home, he's a family man. He's got four children, married, um, and very suburban, middle-class lifestyle. During the day, he's frequenting inner city, um, Kansas City, hanging out with these um, sort of sketchy underworld characters and, you know, prostitutes, strippers, and uh, lots of and lots of different kinds of women. We followed him to homes in the Johnson County area, and we followed him to motels where he had women meet him there. The man was just in total action until 5 o'clock when his wife got off work. Robinson thought he was smarter and brighter than, than anyone else, that uh, if he got caught, he would just tell another lie, as he had done for so many years. And uh, he didn't believe that there was anyone that was going to, to hold him accountable. We did a wiretap. Uh, we would subpoena records for internet usage. We got some search warrants for his email accounts. We had two women in Canada that were sharing emails that he was sending to them, and they were sending it to us, so we were getting almost real time his communications with them. That kind of gave us some insight into what he, he was doing. As investigators suspect, Robinson is frequenting the BDSM websites in search of slaves. Well, to me, he seemed like just a very commonplace uh, little man who you would never suspect being involved in uh, S&M type activities. He referred to himself in emails on the BDSM uh, website as master. And that's what we knew him as, the slave master. His pattern is, if anything, consistent. Robinson agrees to play master to eager submissives, enticing them further with the offer of a job. He promised them the moon, and a lot of these women just took it, were hooked, and came to Kansas City. Investigators are shocked to learn how many women would come to town to be a complete stranger's slave. At the master-slave level, the, the trust is considered to be inviolate and that's a two-way street uh, the master has to have a complete trust of the slave just as much as the slave has trust of the master the authorities soon set up stakeouts at motels where Robinson entertains his out-of-town guests and through the walls a secret world comes alive or they could hear talking a lady's voice his voice uh, they they could hear what they thought was maybe some slaps. And uh, we knew that he was into this BDSM 
um, lifestyle, and that probably was taking place in that room. It was a really tense time for law enforcement because you knew somebody was getting hurt, but the question was what was consensual and when did it cross the line? Police get an unexpected break in the case. One of Robinson's slaves, a woman named Brenda, comes forward with a familiar tale. She came to Lenox uh, uh, to work for a man she knew as James Turner. Uh, she was down on, on her luck. Uh, she was unemployed at the time, had no money. But when she begins meeting with Turner at a local motel, Brenda gets a whole lot more than she bargained for. One of the times they had an argument, and uh, she was struck by him a little too hard. Uh, she went up to the desk to inquire who had rented the room, and she was told James Robinson. And so she knew something wasn't right. Brenda files a complaint with police, accusing Robinson, alias James Turner, of sexual battery. We ended up documenting about 17 false identities that he used with various people over the years. It just went on and on. The more you investigated, the more, the, the deeper and more complex this case got. Aliases, con games, violent sex. Police are now certain their con man is up to something more criminal, and the time to act is now. Days later, another woman comes forward and files a similar complaint, sexual battery plus robbery against John Robinson. With two accusations and search warrants in hand, police finally have enough to make an arrest. We felt like this was gonna be our probably last best chance to catch this guy. On June 2nd, authorities descend on Robinson's home in Olathe, Kansas. We were all a nervous red. It was just very tense and, and kind of a nervous time, I think, for everybody. He answered the door. We knocked on it, uh, was, was polite, was, you know, kind of carefree, invited us in. We told him that he was under arrest. Uh, we told him that we had actually been uh, investigating him for quite a while. The arrest warrant charges Robinson with sexual battery and robbery, but investigators waste no time raising the subject of missing persons. Lisa and Tiffany Stacy, Paula Godfrey, Catherine Clampett, and Suzette Troughton. Robinson kind of turned pale. He started like almost hyperventilating. I remember he turned back and looked at me and he goes, Jesus Christ, like that, and just kind of collapsed in the chair. I think it was a real shock to him. And I think he knew we had him. But when we walked him out of the house, you know, he picked himself back up and he was kind of back to his arrogant self. And he said, you know, you guys are really making a big production out of this, aren't you? Police confiscate Robinson's computer and files dating back years. Leaving nothing to chance, they also secure warrants for several storage units he rents in Olathe, Kansas, in Raymore, Missouri, along with a family farm in Lynn County. It is at these three locations that investigators' worst fears are confirmed. The, the Olathe storage locker uh, proved to be a treasure trove of evidence. Birth certificates, driver's license, social security cards belonging to several of these women the kinds of things that you don't give up unless you're dead. It, it, it sort of confirmed what we'd been thinking all along, and that is we're thinking, where are these letters coming from? It's an impressive haul, but a good defense attorney can argue a simple fact. Where there's no body, there's no crime. The next day, a team hits the Lynn County Farm, along with the Missouri Search and Rescue Canine Unit. Yeah, on the Lynn County property, we found a mobile home. We found a storage shed, some other items out by it. When we did the, the perimeter search where the shed was and the, and the barrels were, um, we found specifically two 
a large 88 gallon uh, hazmat barrels. We were actually going to, to move the barrels out in order for the dog to get a good scent there. And when I rolled the barrel out and brought it upright, uh, then we saw blood coming out. We ended up finding Suzette's body. She was decomposing pretty well by then. You know, you're kind of sad because obviously she's gone. But you're, you're elated because you finally have got something on this guy. Investigators open the second barrel and are stunned by what they find, a second body. But the corpse does not bear any resemblance to the other missing women they've been searching for. The second barrel that we opened took us into a whole new realm of, you know, who's this and what have we gotten into now? Now, instead of one murder investigation, we had two, and we were starting all over with this one. Meanwhile, across the state line at one of Robinson's other storage units, investigators have their own mystery to contend with. Three more barrels. Three more bodies in varying states of decomposition. It was just a sick feeling. I, I was just uh, dumbfounded, I remember. I, mean, I just walked through that night and, and that whole weekend. I mean, I, I remember just... In a, in a haze. Investigators wonder if the long search for Lisa Stacy, Paula Godfrey, and Catherine Clampett has finally come to an end. On June 12th, a pathologist identifies the body found in the second barrel on Robinson's farm as Isabella Laviska, a 21-year-old Polish immigrant. Isabella Laviska had never been reported missing. And it came as quite a shock to that family. They thought she was traveling over in Europe uh, that, because John Robinson had covered his tracks in that case, too. And they had received letters and emails, supposedly from Europe. According to an autopsy report, Isabella and Suzette Troughton both died from blunt force trauma to the head. The likely weapon, a small ball-peen hammer. Most of the women had no defensive injuries, which suggested to us that they didn't know it was coming, meaning they were asleep, maybe looking the other direction. By the end of June comes another shock. Autopsies completed on the remaining three bodies reveal they are not, in fact, Lisa Stacy, Paula Godfrey, or Catherine Clampett. On the contrary, these remains belong to three entirely new victims. Beverly Bonner, Sheila Faith, and her disabled 15-year-old daughter, Debbie, all killed by blunt force trauma. When you think of the enormity and all the people that, that he killed, I, it, it kind of boggles the mind. Even stranger, police find no missing person reports filed for any of the three new victims. An investigation soon reveals that Robinson seduced Beverly Bonner, a prison librarian, while he was incarcerated during the 1990s. The affair continued even after his release. He pretty quickly discovers that she's getting $1,000 a month alimony checks from her ex-husband. And so he um, kills her and then starts pocketing her alimony checks. Like Isabella LaVisca's family, the Bonners are shocked by the news. They knew that something wasn't quite right, but she also was writing letters and cashing alimony checks. So they never quite could figure out if she was missing or not. Sheila and Debbie Faith meet a similar fate after Sheila encounters Robinson in an online chat room. Uh, I don't think that John Robinson had any interest in Sheila romantically. He just had an interest in their disability checks. And he started cashing their checks and cashed them for six years. It now seems almost certain to investigators that Lisa, Tiffany, Paula, and Catherine are also dead. And while Robinson's motive for killing these women remains unclear, 
His ability to manipulate them was undeniable. Robinson had a, an uncanny ability to get inside the heads of the women that he was preying on. And getting them to write or sign batches of letters was the key to his deception. He was able to convince these women to write these letters, to sign their names on blank pieces of paper, because what he would tell them is, we're going to be traveling in China or Paris. You're not going to have time to write letters. So what I want you to do is uh, fill out some letters now. But Robinson's audacity astounds even the FBI when they come across a strange and disturbing new tip. Uh, it, it floored me. I mean, I think it, it just absolutely shocked everybody. Chasing down a tip, authorities soon learned that Robinson helped his brother adopt a baby for $5,000 back in 1985. One of the uh, really shocking moments uh, was when Mrs. Robinson handed me a photograph I looked at my partner and we were kind of stunned. We knew that, well, that's definitely Tiffany. The photograph was given to them by Robinson the day he delivered the baby to her new home, just as Lisa and Tiffany Stacy were reported missing. We believe that, uh, that John Robinson met and ended up taking Lisa Stacy uh, specifically for Lisa's baby, Tiffany and I imagine that he killed her. I mean, you look at Social Security, you look at credit cards, bank accounts, she's never been heard or seen from. The Bureau soon makes a preliminary ID using Tiffany Stacy's footprint from the day she was born. It's a perfect match. How possibly can you be that cruel, not only to kill the, the mother, adopt the kid out to your own brother and actually charged him several thousand dollars for it. They thought everything was on the up and up. They had the papers, they had the adoption forms that looked like they'd been signed by judges and attorneys. They had no clue. The teenage girl, once called Tiffany, is shocked to learn the truth. But ultimately, she decides to stay with the Robinsons. And they considered her their, their daughter. They had raised her. And they wanted to keep her. And they were victims of Mr. Robinson's, just like all these other women were. On October 7th, 2002, 58-year-old John Robinson stands trial in Johnson County, Kansas, for the murder of Lisa Stacy, Suzette Troughton, and Isabella LaVisca. He pleads not guilty. I think John Robinson was the kind of person that thought that, that the world was his. I think he, he thought whatever he needed or whatever he wanted, he would get. It didn't matter who it belonged to. In January of 2003, a jury sentences Robinson to life imprisonment for the murder of Lisa Stacy and two death penalties for the murders of Suzette Trout and Isabella LaVisca. I was elated. I could not think of a man that deserved to suffer the ultimate punishment than John Robinson. As a cop, I mean, that's that's the highlight of my career. This is what you go into law enforcement for, and and I feel great about what we the work we did. It, it was a great case that we put together, and uh, we took a very dangerous person out of out of society. To this day, no one can say for sure what caused Robinson, a family man and two-bit con artist, to become a serial killer. There's no clear picture as to say, this is why he turned out this way. You know, Robinson came from a, a middle-class, uh, religious, uh, suburban family. He has uh, several siblings. You know, they're not involved in criminal activity. He was somebody who didn't really have the ability to empathize with anybody. He was sort of consciousless. The game was everything. The con was everything. Winning was everything. After his trials in Kansas, Robinson makes a deal with prosecutors in Missouri 
a state that also has the death penalty. In exchange for a life sentence, he pleads guilty to the murders of Paula Godfrey, Catherine Clampett, Beverly Bonner, and Sheila and Debbie Faith. To this day, the bodies of Lisa Stacy, Paula Godfrey, and Catherine Clampett have not been recovered. I think that there are more victims than the ones he's ad admitted to. Some of the families didn't even realize that their um, loved ones were no longer alive. There's probably, possibly, other um, victims out there. He's got people that he's killed. He's got people that he's hurt. He's got people that he's stolen from. I mean, to include family members, all just for his own gain, for his, for his own uh, pleasure, whatever. I mean, it's just, it's, to me, it's unfathomable. So what you got here is a, a con man who's also a serial killer. You know, and I'm not sure which came first.